The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. Today we want to talk to you about the University of Nebraska and all the really great and cool things that are going on there. And our guest is going to be the Chancellor, Ronnie Green. Who better to tell us about all of that information? Don't go away. Did you know there's a facility in Lincoln where you can pursue your hobbies or maybe look at some new creative situation that you might like to pursue? It's the studio at Innovation Campus. Stay tuned. Maybe they can help you pursue some of these creative activities. Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake, and today we're going to talk with a philatelist. You know what a philatelist is? A stamp collector. And Dale Niebuhr if, with the Lincoln Stamp Club is here with us today. And it is a fascinating story of those stamps all the way from England to the United States and what's happened with the stamps. So if you're a stamp lover, please join us. I think you'll like it. In Lincoln, we're becoming more and more conscious of bicycling because of the introduction of the bike share program and the development of biking lanes downtown. And you may have a hike and bike trail near you that you see a lot of biking on. Well, today my guest on Live and Learn is Rick Dockhorn of Cycle Works, who's gonna tell us a little bit about bicycling in Lincoln. I'm Sam Truax, and you may be surprised that biking is not just for kids and college students. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. One of the most important things happening in the state of Nebraska is the University of Nebraska. They always have lots of fun and interesting things that are going on. And so today we want to talk a little bit about the university and some of those happenings and, and some of the cool things going on. And the best person we could find to do that for us is the Chancellor, Ronnie Green. Chancellor, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, Jerry, it's great to be here. Okay, so first of all, I, I want to make sure that everybody knows we sort of threw the Chancellor a, a bit of a curveball here. We originally had planned to, to do this interview and it was struggle to find a time and we were going to tape this and uh, talk about all the things and it was going to run in November. Mm -hmm. Now we've decided that all the things that you have to say are so important that they have to get into the October show. So That's great. <laughs> so thanks for uh, sort of rolling with us on that. That's great. Lots of cool things uh, happening um, at the university. This is being taped on the Monday after uh, the Nebraska-Ohio State football game. And um, that's important, not because of the game necessarily, which didn't quite turn out exactly as we wanted, but it was a really prominent event that took place, which was ESPN's Game Day came to town. And that really is an important uh, event. It's not just for uh, the football game, but in terms of giving the, the state and the university recognition. That was pretty cool. Oh, absolutely, Jerry. Um, you know, the Game Day, everybody knows about Game Day that follows collegiate sports and collegiate football in particular. Uh, last time Game Day was in Lincoln was 12 years ago yeah. in 2007 before we played USC and um, so it was a big deal then is a even bigger deal uh, this past weekend to have that that crew here uh, exposing the university to the greater world you know there's there's over two million people that view game day in that three-hour block on wow. Saturday morning before the first games kick off and of course they knew when they came to Nebraska they were going to see the passion for Husker athletics and for the university uh, which certainly was the case. I was there and kind of deeply in the middle of that and a lot of fun with a huge number of our students and alumni and supporters of the university who were there to take all, take all that in. And it goes without saying that there's a little bit of advertising value as I oh, mentioned sure. earlier. Um, estimates are that upwards of a million and a half in My. value of advertising that kind of comes to you um, largely for the for the taking to offer the story of the university so it, it was great um, and we had a pretty big announcement the day before yeah absolutely let's where, talk a little bit about that yeah where we um, announced that in total uh, the University of Nebraska Lincoln between now this fall and out over the course of the next three to four year period ahead of us is making over a half a billion dollars of investment 
um, in infrastructure and, and facilities and being world class in those facilities for academics and for athletics uh, where we compete in the world uh, in both of those areas. Uh, we'd announced earlier uh, over $350 million of investment um, in the campus on the academic side, um, especially in the College of Engineering. That right. had been a big announcement a few weeks earlier. And then on Friday, uh, just before game day, uh, we announced a $155 million expansion of our athletics facilities uh, in football and in academic support and in the training table for all of our student athletes along with some work in the stadium. So really pretty, uh, pretty amazing week in Husker land last week. Uh, game may not have turned out like we, like we would have no, loved not for it exactly. to turn out. Uh, but uh, but we know that our football program is also going in the right direction. Yeah, it was still a, it was still a good thing, and we have a homecoming coming up uh, in another week or so. I do want to talk about that, but I think one of the things that sometimes gets lost when the university is creating all of these things, and the people go, "Wow, the university is doing all this stuff." But you think of all the construction contracts, you think of all the workers, you think of all right. the people that are involved, and the materials and um, I mean, that's really an economic boon. Well, absolutely. I, I, I kid with uh, our team all the time. You know, there was a few years ago here in Lincoln uh, that, that I kind of affectionately referred to it as the time of the cranes. Yes. Construction cranes, right. if you will. Uh, when Pinnacle Bank Arena was being built and our new business building on the university campus, Hawks Hall now, was being built number of projects on campus, a number of projects in the downtown area and the Haymarket development. It, it was just a huge kind of building time during that period of years. We're kind of in the front end of another time like that. Um, we can't think of a time in the university's history at the flagship campus here in Lincoln that has had the level of building and investment that we're going to see over the next few years. So it is very exciting and the economic impact of that locally, of course, is large. Um, but in, more importantly, the investment for the future of the university sure. and what we're going to see happen come out of that uh, is really, really exciting. Right, and I, I want to talk a little bit about that in a minute as well, but let's, let's do talk about homecoming because I think that's a, another really interesting uh, time of year when there's this great uh, <coughs> sort of connection between academics and the athletic program. It's a great football game, should be lots of fun, and we have the homecoming king and queen, but we also have all kinds of people that love to come back and love that connection with the university. Well, and especially, Jerry, this year for us is a very special homecoming because it's the 150th anniversary right. of the university since our founding in 1869. And we've been celebrating that really all year during 2019. Our birthday was actually February the 15th, was our charter date as we refer to it, when the institution was formed here in Lincoln. But we've kind of spread that throughout the whole year, celebrating the 15 decades of impact of this great university on Nebraska and the world. And so this homecoming year, uh, this coming week, uh, when we will be celebrating homecoming, I'm actually doing a skit tonight with a Innocent uh -oh. Society and <laughs> okay. uh, all kinds of things kicking off in the week uh, leading up to the homecoming game next Saturday with Northwestern is a special one. Uh, we've kind of reinstituted some traditional things that oh, uh, from years past on Friday, instead of just having a homecoming parade and some of the exhibits that you see in the Greek houses and floats and things like that, uh, we have gone back to a yesteryear of calling it a corn stock festival. It right. used to be a part of East Campus, yes, actually, it did. historically. Mm -hmm. uh, that's being held on the mall on the campus on Friday. Uh, with a lot of special entertainment and guests. Uh, Hannah Houston is going to be part of that with us, um, as well as Fred Hoiberg and Bill Moose and myself and others. So exciting homecoming coming up this, this coming week that we're very pleased about. And a couple of the uh, colleges and programs are celebrating some fun anniversaries. I know the College of Journalism and Mass Communications <coughs> is celebrating 125 years and the marching band has been around for 140 years. That's, That's right. Pretty cool. So the marching band you know uh, started 10 years after the university started so very early in our history so they are celebrating their their history this weekend. Um, journalism, as you mentioned, our College of Journalism and Mass Communications, 125 years in, in that field. Our College of Engineering, 
uh, really has held classes in engineering since the very beginning of our land grant mission in the 1860s and 1870s, but actually became a college, officially the College of Engineering for the state of Nebraska in 1909. So 110 years of history for that college. You know, with just a lot of these kind of celebratory events that are part of part of the 150th anniversary as well. One of the cool things I think about uh, a couple of those programs is uh, you hear so much talk about uh, innovation and digital technologies and all these mm -hmm. cool things that are going on. But here's a couple of programs who not only are involved in certainly new technologies, but really those core kinds of things that, that the university has taught for, for a long, long time. That's kind of a fun balance that yeah. the university continues to do. Yeah, that's right. And, it, and it, education continues to evolve as well. You know, we, we're, we're not educating the same way we did in 1869, right. obviously. We're not educating the same way we, they did in 1988 when I was a PhD student here at the University of Nebraska. Um, and the advent and use of technology and both in the way we educate, but also in terms of the emphasis areas that we have in innovation around around technology and use of technology uh, as well. So, uh, you know, we've started some exciting things at the university in that regard here recently as well. You know I like to talk philosophy, so let's talk philosophically for just a minute or so, because universities in a lot of quarters are um, <coughs> finding themselves on the end of some complaints about whether it's too much or it's the budget is too much, mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. You and I both know that the uh, state of Nebraska could not exist without the University right. of Nebraska. How do you how do you deal with some of those arguments when you when you, people talk to you about that? Well, it's you know uh, we talked about the land grant university for the state. The University of Nebraska is the people's university of the state of Nebraska. That history we were hearkening back to a few minutes ago. Uh, it the, the DNA of the state in many ways. I refer to it this way is tied to the University of Nebraska. Uh, both from the, the educating the, the next generation, right, and, the, and workforce development that comes with that. Um, it's just been a central and key part of this state and with this place for, for all that period of time. And never before, uh, I know I'm a little bit biased in saying this as a university leader, but never before has the value of a college education and of the institution that delivers that been higher and more of more value to society. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversation around uh, the need for a college degree, the need for that in the future. We know that those needs are even higher than they have been in the past. Uh, there's a lot of conversation about the cost of education. There's a lot of conversation about whether that's um, a wise investment. Um, a lot of conversation about student debt. All of those, those are, are areas that we know that the value of that education for the future moving forward in all, all areas, but especially in a number of them, has never been higher um, and, and important to this state. The other, the other element is that the university as a driver of economic development mm -hmm. in the state, um, here uh, we know that the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, the campus that I lead here, um, that the direct economic impact annually on the state of Nebraska from the activities of the university, just the operations and activities and the output of the university is in excess of $2.2 billion a year. Wow. And when you put that together with the entire university system, the Med Center in Omaha, UNO, the Omaha campus, the Kearney campus, um, the College of Technical Agriculture, the entirety of the university system, it's in excess of four and a half billion dollars wow. per year of direct impact on the state. So absolutely, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that the value of the university is very, very high and will be even greater, I believe, in the future. And that doesn't even take into consideration all of the research that's being done. And oh, I have said for years and years that people just don't really understand all of the research right. that, is, that is taking place and the changes that have been made and the, and the patents and all those things. Okay, right. let's, uh, we're going to run out of time. <laughs> let's talk about some of the, the cool things that are happening. Um, you mentioned uh, the uh, College of Engineering. And mm -hmm. as, uh, I mean, it's a great college and continues to get better and improve. And with that, 
sometimes means new facilities are necessary. So, so we've, we know we've had a College of Engineering, as we said earlier, mm -hmm. uh, for 110 years at the university. It's the sole College of Engineering in Nebraska and for the state of Nebraska, one of the uh, leading uh, colleges of engineering uh, regionally, certainly, with a lot of history around infrastructure development, a lot of history in the civil area in particular, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, across the breadth of the fields, architectural, construction engineering, mm -hmm. um, ag engineering, certainly. Um, and we know that if we look out ahead, that the level of skill required and the workforce needs in engineering that we need to grow our College of Engineering here. Yeah. And, and it's the highest single priority for growth in the entirety of the University of Nebraska, certainly here at Lincoln, and in the entire system for the university. Uh, 15,000 jobs expected in this area in Nebraska over the course of the years ahead of us. Wow. We know we need to probably escalate the college to double in size. So we've recently announced that we are in a major building phase for facilities in our college here to match that growth. Um, Rebuilding re, uh, of the Scott Engineering Center that was built in 1972 here on the Lincoln campus, a $75 million rebuild in addition to that facility to grow our research capacity for the college. And then just a couple of weeks ago, we announced an $85 million new instructional facility to be known as Kiewit Hall hmm. uh, due to a lead group, a lead gift of the Kiewit Corporation, a major power in the engineering world, as you know, uh, based here mm -hmm. out of Nebraska, um, that will put us into a, one of the leading instructional facilities for engineering uh, that will be built on campus in the engineering complex as well. So $160 million of investment wow. in new facilities, the largest project in our history for the college uh, and for the university as a whole um, that we know we're very excited about what will come out of that. Um, be done by 2022, 2023, time period for the growth of the College of Engineering. Fabulous. Let's talk uh, briefly, because uh, I don't want to leave this out, the new Johnny Carson Center for Emerging Media Arts. It officially opened um, this fall uh, on October 26th. That is going to be some really interesting things going to come out of that college. It, it, it sure is, Jerry. Um, we opened the facility uh, in August uh, with the kickoff of the school year this fall. Um, first cohort of students in this new program, the Johnny Carson Center for the Emerging Media Arts, as it's known, uh, in our College of Fine and Performing Arts. Uh, Cart Johnny, of course, was a UNL alum, yep. Norfolk native, as Nebraskans know well, and was a, an alum of the journalism college, yes. actually, mm -hmm. here at the university, um, and was supportive of the university throughout his life. Uh, he talked about the Cornhusker Marching Band. He loved to talk about the Cornhusker Marching Band on The Tonight Show. And then four years ago, his foundation um, made a $20 million gift to build this Johnny Carson Center for Emerging Media Arts. That is one of a kind, nothing like it in the world. Uh, we refer to it as we're going to develop the pirates and the wizards of the future in yeah. terms of being able to tell stories. Yeah, it seems like a little bit of a work in progress yeah. yet still. Yeah, because, so uh, this, this be new fun. first class was recruited from around the world, 33 students in this first cohort coming here from all over the world, highly competitive to get in. To, uh, to this new program. They've also been designated as uh, the first in the Big Ten uh, Hewlett, Packard, Hewlett Packard Educause campus. Hmm. Uh, is a partnership with Hewlett Packard. The only ones like that in the country are at MIT and Yale and Dartmouth. So it gives you an indication of the interest in this program. But virtual reality, augmented reality, 3D imaging, holograph imaging, oh my. to be able to tell stories and be creative in that way is, is the, the nature of this program. So very, very excited about its development. Uh, two new faculty along with Director Megan Elliott, three more being hired at the moment, fully ramped up, will be at about 150 students um, over the course of the four-year curriculum. So Sounds exciting. incredible. I wish we had more time uh, because there are all kinds of other things going on, but as always, we're out of time. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of, I know, a very busy schedule to come and uh, talk to us. Come back and see us again. Well, thank you, Jerry, and go be great. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for tuning in today. And remember, 
it's never too late to live and learn. Hi, I'm Randy Jones with Aging Partners. Did you know that Lincoln expects a 75% increase in the number of seniors living in our community over the next 15 years? Aging Partners is a community service that provides fitness programs to help keep older adults strong and healthy. This year, Lincoln Cares donations are providing funds for new fitness equipment. You can help make this happen. Sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month. The Studio on Innovation Campus is a facility that is available to the community for you to pursue some hands-on hobbies. I'm Doug Jones, and with me today is David Martin, who's the manager of that facility. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Doug. First of all, uh, tell us a little bit about the studio and some description of it. Sure thing. Uh, Nebraska Innovation Studio is a 16,000 square foot maker space, and a uh, maker space is just what you would expect. It's a space where people make things. So what we have is we try to provide the space and the tools so people can make what they want to make. Uh, that said, we have a full wood shop. We have sewing machines, embroidery machine. We have a long arm quilter. We have a ceramics area, screen printing, a vinyl cutter. We have 3D printers. And we have a large work area. Also, we have a metal shop that's under construction that will be opening in late September. So um, really, we have, a, we have the kind of uh, workshop you'd like to have if you had unlimited space and resources. So uh, sort of in your own uh, basement, if you will. Exactly. You know. It's like, uh, yeah, a lot of people have uh, nice wood shops in their garage, but we have, we have that on uh, steroids, you could say. Now, I mentioned Innovation Campus. Tell us specifically where and, and what are the goals uh, of the studio? Well, we are, uh, as you said, on Innovation Campus, and the goals of the studio really depends on the member. People join Innovation Studio, and they are able to do what they want to do. So at any given time, we have about 300 active members, about half of those are students and half are community members. We are open to anybody. Uh, and the projects range from things for fun, uh, people making uh, cutting boards or cutting coasters in the lasers, to people who are craft entrepreneurs. We have a couple members who make jewelry. We have people who make furniture. Um, and then we have uh, students doing things for school. Uh, we have um, we have entrepreneurs who are trying to prototype designs, and we have uh, local businesses who are um, also going in there and, and testing out new, new designs. We also do a lot of things with the community. So last year we had a bunch of engineering students make uh, enrichment for the giraffe exhibit at the zoo. Uh, believe it or not, giraffes only sleep one hour a day, so they need a lot of enrichment <laughs> the other 23 hours. And, and so the students worked with the giraffe keeper at the zoo, and they made these incredible uh, toys for the giraffes to play with. This, this is a, a unique facility for a community to have. How did it come about? It came about as a result of uh, the persistence and the vision of a professor named Shane Ferreter. He's an engineering professor. He's also an entrepreneur. He has a company called Virtual Incision that's also at Innovation Campus, which does uh, robotic surgery, which is quicker and less uh, invasive than just regular surgery. And so Shane Ferreter uh, pushed this idea with the university. A lot of universities have maker spaces, and it was Shane's vision and uh, persistence that got it done. One thing that's really almost unique about Innovation Studio is we are open to anybody. A lot of universities have maker spaces and they're closed. They're just for students and faculty and staff. But we are open to anybody. So we have a great community of makers at Innovation Studio. Not so people will come in and uh, see other people doing interesting things and they, uh, you can always say, hey, how do you do that? And members will always share information, share knowledge, share, share expertise. So we really offer a community of makers at Innovation Studio. You talk about sharing I information, but what about instruction? Do you offer instruction as well? We do. Yeah, we have, uh, we have training on every piece of equipment. So once you remember, you have free access to all the equipment and you also have free training on all the equipment. In fact, training is required on, on most pieces of equipment. So, uh, for example, you might get training on the saws or the lasers or the 3D printers, and after you've done the training, you're allowed to use that equipment. Of course, even after that, we have, um, we have people there all the time to help people, because you get a lot of information in that one hour of training on the laser, for example, and we're there to help if people run into problems. 
So you are, it's there's one on one. <coughs> oh, I know. Is there group instruction as well? well the, the trainings are generally <coughs> in small groups, um, but then after that, people can always get one on one instruction, and we that's what we're there for. We want to help people accomplish their their goals. So you have a lot of retired people participating. We do actually. We have a lot of retired people with uh, come with all sorts of expertise and, and backgrounds, and and they're a huge addition to Innovation Studio. Um, there, David uh, Cochran's a retired professor, and he does these beautiful images that are that are etched on the laser, and then he puts white paint on it to kind of create the image, as you can see there. Um, and so uh, we have other members who are retired. Um, this is a group. Uh, Wendy Weiss on the left is a retired. Instruct uh, professor at um, in fashion and merchandising, and she's right. teaching some veterans there how to use the loom. So uh, really have a really a rich group of retirees in there who are are doing very very cool things. That's a picture of the long arm quilter, and um, that's a 14 foot long arm quilter, and and it's probably our second most popular piece of equipment after the laser. So it's it's great. We have sort of the high tech lasers, and then we have the traditional. Um, long arm quilter. We also have workshops. This is a, was a workshop on cr painting barn quilt designs. Okay. So uh, we try to, you know, keep things interesting and keep having uh, new workshops when we have the opportunity. Um, we have members, as I mentioned, who are craft entrepreneurs and who want to, are thinking about businesses. Uh, Mike Koopman's a retired architect on the left, and he was getting advice from the Nebraska Business Development Council on how he might proceed if he wants to start a business. In the background of that picture, David, uh, is, is one of the hands that we've seen around town. Were they made out there? Well, the hands themselves were not made there, but we have an artist uh, named David Manzanares, and he makes, he kind of created what goes on the hands. So he, uh, we, he did a, a two or three sets of hands out there, but we did not, he did not take credit for the hands themselves. But you, they were involved in the process. Exactly, yeah. So that was fun to see those, see the transformation of some plain hands into something, some art. Now, when is the facility available? We are open six days a week, and uh, we try to shift the hours to, to accommodate different schedules. So we're open Monday through Saturday. Monday and Tuesday are open 2 to 9. Wednesday and Thursday from 12 to 7, and Friday and Saturday from 10 to 4. Do you have to make arrangements before you go? Or? No, once you're a member, you can go anytime uh, we're open. And there's, as I said, there's no charge to use the equipment. You, once you're there, you have access to all the equipment. We have a lot of members who come for one thing. They might know wood, uh, woodworking, or they might want to use the long arm quilter. And then they realize that there's nothing stopping them from learning something new. And we love to see that. We have a couple of retired wood turners, and they've just learned the laser. So now they're lasering their, their uh, insignia, their lab on the bottom of the bowls they turn. So, Interesting. So we love to see people kind of expand their knowledge and their creativity. Now, you mentioned membership. Let's talk about that. What, what does it cost? The membership depends on what you're what your connection is to the university. So undergraduates pay $15 a month, faculty, staff, and alumni pay $40 a month, and regular community members pay $60 a month. And it's, it's month to month. It's just a month is 30 days from whenever you sign up. And so, you know, our goal really is to make it interesting and exciting and, and enriching for people so they keep signing up month to month. We're not like a, a gym where they want you to sign up for a year and never show up. We want people to <laughs> sign up for a month and keep signing up. Then you can <coughs> go as often as you want. Exactly, and uh, and there's no <coughs> no charge to use all the equipment in there. The only thing you would pay for is if you use the materials we have there, you would pay for the materials. But uh, you can go as often as you want. Now you mentioned there's somebody there to help with the equipment, but so if you decide, you know, at 11 o'clock in the morning, you want to go out and use a lathe, there'll be somebody there to to help if you it's required. Yeah, I mean, if you've taken the training in the lathe and you go in there and you're having trouble, someone is there to help you. What, what about you? We've shown you, shown some of the examples of the things that have been made. What are some of the other interesting things that stand out to you that uh, have been really successful projects? Well, um, we have a lot of connections with makerspaces around the country. We're supporting uh, a network of makerspaces as part of a, a library grant. 
So there are many maker spaces going into the small town libraries across Nebraska, and that's been exciting. We like to think of ourselves as kind of the hub of maker spaces in the state of Nebraska. And you know, we're always uh, looking for new and interesting community projects. We have a very uh, a fantastic project with veterans. So uh, veterans come from the Veterans Administration every Wednesday and Thursday, and they, they work on the mini lays, they make beautiful pens, and they do other things. And um, it's, we had a member come from San Diego, and uh, he had done it out there with veterans, and it's been shown to be very therapeutic. So veterans come into Nebraska Innovation Studio every Wednesday and Thursday and turn pens as, as part of their program. So that's been really exciting to see. And that was funded with an anonymous donation. So we're a hybrid, so we rely on uh, donations for all the equipment and uh, maintenance. Uh, donations and member fees pay for the equipment and the maintenance of the equipment and the university pays for the salaries and the overhead. So we're a, we're a hybrid and, and so we were lucky enough to get this donation that pays for the veterans program. So that's been exciting. So when you accumulate some funds and from these membership fees, you, you're in a position to buy more equipment? Exactly. We just <coughs> got a six color embroidery machine that's been very popular and we had, enough, we had a lot of people say, hey, are you going to get an embroidery machine? So uh, we realized that there was a kind of a demand out there and we had the funds so we bought this beautiful six color embroidery machine and now it is, uh, it's getting a lot of use so that's fun to see. Then as you, as you look into the future, uh, anything else on your, your to, oh, to do list? Well, we have a or wish list. <laughs> we have a metal shop that's under construction now, so I guess the, the we're, that should be done in late September. And I guess the big big thing we have in our wish list there is a water plasma table, plasma cutter, so you can cut metal precisely, like the laser can cut metal. Uh, we have our, our lasers cut wood and acrylic, but this would cut metal. Yeah, you know, when you say metal shop, what what all would be involved in that? Well, we have we're going to have welders, grinders, shears, brakes, mills, lathes. Uh, saws, tube benders, English wheels, so we're going to hopefully wow. have the whole gamut of metalworking tools. And one thing that I think you'll find interesting is we have um, a virtual welder trainer. So rather than people uh, burning themselves trying to learn <laughs> how to weld, we have this virtual reality set up so they will learn on the virtual welder and when people hit a certain score on the virtual welder, we'll let them weld in real life. So it, it's a matter of people using this maybe to pursue a hobby, but there's lots of things maybe people never thought of that might, might flip their switch in terms of their creativity. Absolutely, I mean, as I said, we were a community of makers, so people see what other people are doing and realize that they maybe they want to try that themselves. So I, I really think it's really the community that, that makes Nebraska Innovation Studio so special. The, the funding, um, is, is fairly secure, you, you hope. We, <laughs> we, we always face <coughs> budget cuts, it seems like, at the university, but uh, in well, terms we, of maintaining the facility? We feel pretty good right now, so. Innovation right. Campus is always expanding, and uh, so hopefully it will continue to expand in your facility as well. Yes, absolutely, and we're always, you know, uh, looking for, for new partnerships and new entrepreneurs coming in the door. We, uh, we actually had Huddle, the local sports video analysis company coming in and prototyping there. We have an inventor that's been prototyping something that we're hoping becomes big. Also we had a, um, someone from Glass Edge, a local company, they uh, 3D scanned uh, a garage door drum, shrunk it down, and then that became the basis for the new windows and the, and the luxury boxes on the west side of Memorial Stadium. So instead of flipping out, they now roll up and that, that design started at Innovation Studio, so that's exciting. David, thanks a lot for being with us today. This has been very informational and provides an opportunity for people in the community to pursue their creativity. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Remember, it's never too late to live and learn how to pursue your hobbies or look to creative juices to do something new. Legal services are a part of the spectrum of senior services available through our eight area agencies on aging. Attorneys can assist and educate seniors on consumer credit and debt collection issues, as well as help them plan ahead with advanced directives. Attorneys can also help seniors with consumer fraud and financial exploitation concerns, and also guide them through government benefit issues. For more information, contact the Elder Access Line at 800-527-7249.
Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake, and today we're going to be talking about stamp collecting, which is really fascinating. And Dale Niebuhr is here with us today. He's a philatelist. Don't you love that word? Mm -hmm. What does that word mean? <laughs> what, that a philatelist is someone who collects stamps? <laughs> you're, you're certainly that. When did you start collecting stamps? Well, my dad was a stamp collector, so I started at a young age, maybe seven, eight years old. Oh. Um, I had a U.S. collection because it was easiest to collect stamps that came in the mail to, you know, in, to the family every day. And then later I developed an interest in foreign stamps. Uh, I was fascinated with the geography and the history and the culture of, of other countries. Um, well, how did you get those stamps? Well, I would go to stamp club meetings with my oh. dad. Oh. And we had a couple of dealers in the stamp club and I would buy inexpensive stamps from them. And pretty soon I filled up, I had about five albums that I was filling up. And that continued up into my teenage years when uh, school activities kind of took over. And I, of course, I got married and raised a family, so the, my stamp collection sat on the shelf in the closet for many years. Uh, but then when my dad passed away, uh, I inherited his collection. And a few years later, I retired. So all of a sudden, I had a lot of time uh -huh. to, to look at the stamp collection again. And, and I decided to bring it up to date and, and uh, join the stamp club again. Well, good for you, and you're the president now, aren't you? That's correct. Well, uh -huh. you just rise to the top. Yeah. I was just looking at, uh, I just bought a book of stamps. And I looked at them and I said, but they've shrunk, the incredible shrinking, what, what's happening? Yeah. And, and the price has gone up dramatically, oh, too. Oh, yes. I think, what, what was the price of the first stamp? I mean, like a penny or something like well, that? Well, yeah, actually it was more expensive in the very beginning, but then the price was driven down to about three cents, so, yeah. But yeah, now the, the post office is, is issuing self-adhesive stamps, um, and they issue a lot of common stamps like the American flag, but they also have a lot of uh, attractive, larger commemorative stamps that come out each year, too. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the, the people who are, are philatelists and, and, uh, and start this as a hobby. When did you f really start? Yeah, well, uh, for me, it was a, it was a childhood uh, mm -hmm. type of thing, and, and uh, uh, and a lot of people had the same experience. They collected as a child, set it aside for a period of years, and then took it up again later in life. Um, for us, for a lot of us, it was when we retired. Mm -hmm. who, who, did the, who was on the first stamp? Uh, the first uh, stamp was uh, issued back in 1847. Whoa! Uh, for the United States, anyway. It was uh, Ben Franklin. Mm -hmm. I, th I think we might have a picture of that coming up. Um, and it, it was... Um, Oh, it's eight cents. Was yeah, eight, it was eight cents at that. It was in 1972 when that mm -hmm. stamp was issued, and um, it it was uh, done to celebrate uh, stamp collecting as a hobby, and it um, featured the picture of Ben Franklin on the original stamp, <clears throat> and of course he was the first uh, postmaster at the time. So it's kind of a stamp within a stamp, and then it has a magnifying glass on it because that signifies one of the tools of the trade to be able to examine the details of a stamp. Mm -hmm. uh, when did the, the Lincoln chapter actually begin? Uh, the Lincoln Stamp Club was chartered in 1964, but it was, had been meeting for some years before that. Nobody knows for sure um, just how long. But uh, today we have about 45 members. Uh, we meet twice a month, and, um, and we also sponsor an annual stamp show. Uh, the picture that we're looking at here is a picture from that stamp show, and in the foreground you see uh, kids looking and beginning uh, collectors looking through tubs of stamps and picking out stamps for a penny apiece or a nickel apiece. Uh, and in the background on the left you see some stamp exhibits. Uh, a lot of our members will exhibit parts of their collection. Uh, or do some historical background on it and, and uh, talk to the public about that. And we also do evaluations of stamp collections that people bring in to let them know if they have anything of value that, that a stamp dealer might be interested One in. One thing I was fascinated by is John Lennon was a big stamp collector. Yes, right. Um, there are actually a, quite a few celebrities that were stamp collectors. Here's a picture of uh, John Lennon's uh, collection. Uh, it was a childhood collection. It was only about 500 stamps, and they weren't worth all that much, but his handwriting and his autograph uh -huh. also appear in the album, and now it's in the Smithsonian Institute. Oh, very, very now, good. <laughs> and, th and there are a number of other celebrities, too. Probably the most famous American collector was President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, took up the hobby uh, when he developed polio, and he had over a million stamps in, in his collection. And he was very active, even while he was president, he collected stamps and he even helped to design several stamps that were issued under his administration. Well, one of the most famous stamps was the, the it's called the Penny 
What the, the penny, penny black? Penny black. Let's take a look at that because that was really it. Uh, right. That's odd. This was the first postage stamp in the world that was issued in 1840 uh, by Great Britain. It was called the penny black uh, because it was a one cent stamp and it, it was all black in color. It actually features the uh, profile of Queen Victoria. Oh, that was Queen Victoria. That's, that's right. And, um, she looks good. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, and it was, uh, you'll notice there's no perforations around it. That's because it was issued in sheets of 100 and you would have to take scissors to cut them out. But it did have gum on the back that you could adhere. And this was the idea of uh, Sir Roland Hill. Um, to His idea was to prepay the postage rather than have the recipient pay the postage when a courier delivered it. And so that became uh, very common. You could just lick the stamp, put it on the envelope, and then the post office would cancel it so it couldn't be used again. And, uh, and, and so that became popular soon. Other countries followed suit. Well, if you had a picture like the one we just saw, what would that be worth? Well, that particular stamp, there were quite a few of them issued. There were several varieties of the penny black, but the most common one uh, is worth a, is a several hundred dollars. You could actually buy one if you wanted oh, to. Okay. Well, one of the interesting thing is uh, there's a plane that's flying up. Well, flying upside down. Yeah, it's a stamp uh -huh. <laughs> with a plane flying upside down. And I was so interested in that, and I thought. Why would they do that? That's kind of dangerous. <laughs> well, yeah, this stamp is called the Inverted Jenny. Uh, it was issued in 1918 by the post office. It was one of the first airmail stamps. And the plane that's featured in there uh, is, the, is, is a Curtis JN4, or Jenny for short. And uh, what happened here is uh, you'll notice the stamp is printed in two colors. So they had to run it through the printing press twice. And on the second time around, whoever was doing the printing put the plate in upside down. Uh -oh. And so a bunch of stamps were issued with, this, with the airplane upside down. Now they discovered most of this fairly early and they found the sheets and destroyed most of them. But one sheet uh, survived and it was eventually sold by a postal clerk to a uh, collector who in turn sold it to a dealer for about $15,000. <laughs> and then it was resold to another collector for $20,000. And that person decided that it would be worth even more if he would split it up into individual stamps or blocks of four. And so over the years, these stamps became widely dispersed. Some of them were lost for a while, but eventually they were all accounted for except for one. And today, if you, yeah, if you were to um, want one of those stamps, it's valued at between three and four hundred thousand dollars. Wish I had one of those. <laughs> that yeah. would be that was twenty-four cents or something, twenty-eight cents. Eighteen, yeah. You can see them on display. We had one on display at our national stamp show, and you could actually see it up close. But uh, where is the national stamp club show? Well, it it rotates around. Uh, mm -hmm. We just had one in Omaha uh, recently, and uh, we had almost over four thousand visitors. <gasps> Uh, we had 75 stamp dealers from around the country and over a thousand frames oh, of exhibits. Oh my goodness. Um, how does someone start collecting stamps if they're interested in it? Well, it's really pretty simple. You don't need many uh, tools. We mentioned the magnifying glass. Mm -hmm. You also need a pair of tongs, which look like tweezers, only they have rounded edges so you can handle the stamps. Mm -hmm. um, a perforation gauge tells you how many perforations are around the stamp. Uh, you might need a watermark tray and fluid so you can see the watermarks on the back of the stamp. And you need stamp hinges to put them in an album. You can either buy a commercial album uh, or you can make your own. You can print pages on your computer and printer at home if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really pretty easy to get started. Some people still try to soak stamps off of the envelopes, although the self-adhesive stamps are harder to do now. So most people end up buying stamps from stamp dealers, either at a hobby mm -hmm. store or at a stamp show or a lot of stamps are bought and sold over the internet on websites and eBay and that sort of thing. What happens to people you know, when somebody, the mother and dad pass and they were stamp collectors and so the children inherit that, what should they, and they're not interested in it perhaps, right. what should they do with that collection? Well, it's a very common occurrence and uh, we, oh. do, we do encourage people to try to keep the collection or find somebody in the family that might be interested in, in uh, keeping it going. But if not, uh, we do free evaluations of stamp collections. Bring, people bring them to our stamp shows or contact us about it. And uh, we'll tell them if there's anything valuable in it uh, that a stamp dealer might be interested in. Uh, many times we find that it's just a beginner collection or a casual collection. Uh, doesn't have a lot of value. And so many times people will donate those stamps to our club and we'll try to recycle them by offering them to kids or beginning collectors. If somebody wanted to join your club, oh, who do they contact? Well, uh, the, the, the best way is to go to our website, uh, which is um, 
lincolnstampclub.org. Mm -hmm. um, we meet twice a month, um, and, and we meet on at the um, on the first and third Thursdays at 7 p.m. at St. Paul United Methodist Church in downtown Lincoln. Um, but uh, really, on our website, they can learn more about our club. Uh, they can read our newsletter. They can uh, read about upcoming events, and they can also contact us with uh, with questions or requests about stamp collecting. I want to ask you about this. Mm -hmm. This is a current stamp. I bought these at the U.S. Post Office, and I looked at the price and said, whoa, they've gone up and they've shrunk. Yeah. They're littler. Yeah, oh. we're up to 55 cents now. 55 yeah. cents. Oh. These are, and these are some of the common stamps that people use, but as I mentioned, there are many more colorful stamps. They issue about 60 to 80 stamps per well, year. Why did they shrink it? So I suppose just for efficiency and economy, that they're cheaper to produce that way. Well, here's one, one of my great concerns. Fewer and fewer people are sending letters right. in the mail. <laughs> it just breaks my heart uh -huh. because I love, I love to get a letter from a friend, an old friend or something in the mail and read it. And it doesn't have to be handwritten, mm. I mean typed or whatever, but it's so welcome amidst the junk that I get in my mailbox every sure. day. Do you have a solution for this? I'm ready to cry. Well, yeah, really, not really. Um, stamp collecting has evolved over the years. You know, it was really popular. Uh, among um, baby boomers and their parents back from the 1950s to the 1990s. Uh, and since then, um, it's, had, it's gradually declined as far as the number of stamp collectors and stamp dealers. But it has evolved and people have become much more specialized in what they collect. They might collect a particular country, especially if there's some family origin involved. Mm -hmm. Or they'll pick a topic, like if you like dogs or flowers or sports, you can find many, many stamps from around the world that would support your, your area of interest. So, and like I said, most, a lot more of the uh, collecting and buying and selling is done by internet now and websites. And so there's just a different way of, of collecting them than there used to be. Well, I'm glad you're the head of the Stamp Collecting Club right here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Sure. It's been delightful, really been delightful. Uh, I want you to send a letter <laughs> in the mail, handwritten, to your most favorite person. Will you do that? <laughs> Will you do that for me? They'll be so receptive and appreciative. And certainly, Dale Nieber, you're just doing a terrific job. We're really, really pleased. And don't forget, it's always remember that it's never too late to live and learn about collecting stamps. Hi, I'm Randy Jones with Aging Partners. Did you know that Lincoln expects a 75% increase in the number of seniors living in our community over the next 15 years? Aging Partners is a community service that provides fitness programs to help keep older adults strong and healthy. This year, Lincoln Cares donations are providing funds for new fitness equipment. You can help make this happen. Sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month. I'm Sam Truax, and today on Live and Learn, my guest is Rick Dockhorn of CycleWorks, who's very involved in biking in Lincoln. And he's here to tell us about how us more mature citizens can become involved in biking. Rick, when I was at your shop, I noticed that there were no kids or college age customers, they were all more mature people. Does that kind of indicate a trend in bicycling in Lincoln? I don't know that it indicates a trend or not. It might indicate more the time of day. <clears throat> you know, more, most people that are going to be uh, the mature crowd have more freedom, more time on their hands. Yes. And so when the time of day between, I don't know, say 10 and 4, uh, we see a lot of that crowd. In between times after that, then that's when the rest of them come in. Yeah, I know your I know your shop serves more than uh, like Walmart bikes and things like that. So the people yeah. that come in there are more interested in real real biking too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so consequently, uh, why, why do you believe that uh, people are sticking with biking and and coming into your shop and and, and other biking shops to? Well, just in general, I think biking is, is uh, a popular activity. Uh, it's good for you. The uh, cost to get into it is relatively low. And we have abundant facilities in the city of Lincoln. There, there you go. But I'm familiar with 
the program in Austin, Texas, where it's some, similar to a bike share, where you put a card in the rack and take your bike out, and then when you return it, you you put your card back in. Mm -hmm. That's somewhat like bike share here in in Lincoln. So yes, it is. Consequently, it is really strongly promoted by the city to keep the traffic downtown traffic as low as low as possible. And it's been can, yeah, it's been very well received and it's very popular as yeah. well. And bike share is doing that. My bike share is doing the same thing here in Lincoln. Is yeah. it? It's yeah. got quite a bit of activity to keep. They're way ahead of their projected growth um, by two or three years. It's, it's really taken off well. Well, again, in some cases, I believe some of the people who haven't ridden a bike since they were kids really are kind of looking into that possibility, such as more people are living downtown in some of the condominiums and things, and they wouldn't even have to have a car. They could, they could have a bike instead they could. and, and they could. get around. So, yep. so Lincoln's a very rideable city. Yes, yes, it is. And some of those people would be coming to you, but you haven't noticed anybody coming to say, "Hey, I'm going to replace my car with my bike or anything like oh, that." Oh, sure. Yeah, we get well, those. They do. Yeah, they, you have. We get you people have? that are deciding to. Uh, uh, ditch the car and just go by bike. They yes, they manage to craft their lifestyle. Go. That's what Austin, Te that's what Austin, Texas is trying to do too. Mm -hmm. Is just get people to do that. I believe you're involved. In, I don't believe you're involved in it, but could you explain a little bit about bike share? Is it kind of like that Austin program where you put your identifier in there? Or? I'm not sure how their program r runs, but uh, I would assume that most of them are pretty much the same. Where uh, you can buy passes in Lincoln here for a certain amount of time, um, or you can buy a one-time event, and I think they, uh, they use your credit card for just a one-time thing, and you get the bike for X amount of minutes, and you go over that amount of minutes, they charge you for more, and you can rent them at one station and leave them at another station. You don't have to return to the one you rented from. Do people ever come to, to your shop and say, I'd like to rent a bike so I can try it out before I buy it or anything. Do you? Do we get requests for rentals, sure. Do you do that? Huh? Uh, well, you get requests when we don't actually rent any bikes. Mm -hmm. um, it just wasn't a good business fit for us, but they're, uh, the university, Outdoor Rec, rents bicycles. Yeah. And we refer people to them quite a bit. Yes, I could go for that. I can go for that. The environmental benefits of a bike use include the fact that some folks ride their bike not only for exercise, but they go to the grocery store sure. with their bike and they, you know, go to do their errands mm -hmm. with the bike. And so we get a lot of those kind of shoppers in, uh, they'll buy a bike and then they'll have to put a rack on the back so they can carry things. And we have uh, all kinds of panniers that they can put on the bikes, to carry groceries in. Uh, we have trailers that they can pull, uh, that they can put their tubs in to pull groceries. Yeah. Uh, it's really a, a, a pretty popular idea and especially farmer's market goers. They don't have to worry about parking. You definitely see more and more bike racks on cars too. Yep. I mean, yep. So that's something that's just catching on, I guess, because because people, there's not that many more bikes. There's just that many more bike racks, I think. I don't know. Well, and like I said, Lincoln's a real rideable city. You know, when they uh, completed the, the in street bike lane, that made downtown Lincoln more accessible to a lot of people. And, uh, uh, especially like the farmer's market, it's, it's huge down there, the number of bikes that show up. Well, in addition to the environmental and health benefits of biking, there's also some social aspects of it, like the taco run to Eagle, Nebraska, mm -hmm. where all the bikers get together and go out and have a taco and Eagle yeah. and things like that. Uh, uh, there's a couple of them, uh, Tour du Brew, they do once a month. Uh, uh, and that's one that starts at one of the uh, local liquor stores comes up to our shop and then they finish it uh, over in the hay market with the food trucks and oh, yeah. and more drinks there. Um, and there's uh, the local bike club, the Great Plains Bicycle Club, uh, they generally have some social rides. Uh, so there's a lot of different social rides going on. There you go. That, I, you know, I, I've kind of noticed on that Run to Eagle, for example, it's this same people go back to be with the people that they know and, mm -hmm. you know, and they New, the new people are very, very well accepted, but yeah, depending on the event, it's a on the on the weather, it's a huge event. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Well, even though it is believed that biking has health and environmental and social benefits, you know, many older people are kind of worried about about a fall, 
Is there any way to combat that, the danger of falling? Uh, you could do things. You could get uh, the adult trikes. Uh, those are available. Uh, they make uh, recumbent bicycles in a, a trike yeah. fashion. Um, if, if they're, they're pretty interesting to ride. Actually, the adult trikes have some limitations to them because they, um, uh, they only have one speed. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you can't maybe go as fast as you want. Yep. Uh, but they do have options on those. But uh, the uh, recumbent trikes are, yeah. are pretty useful. For people, for people who are not familiar with recumbent bikes, they're basically low bikes where you're sitting down and pushing forward with your feet, not up and down like you do on a standard bike yeah, or a trike. Yeah, yeah. Typically a recumbent is when and your feet are at the same level as your hips. Kind of if you fall over, you don't fall very far at least. Well, on a recumbent. Yeah. <laughs> but how about if you have a trailer, do the trailer, does the trailer support you at yeah. all or are they just flexible? So yeah. they're made to flex so they don't cause an accident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there are, are there any notable occasions or events that you recall, such as, you know, a hundred year old man completes the Buran or something like that? The Buran being is a bike ride across Nebraska that's an annual event where they go to different towns and uh, I'm more familiar with the Tour de Nebraska, and it has a, uh, I checked with the organizer, their average age of the riders was 52 years old. Wow, Now that's there you not go. a senior, but that's up there. Yeah. And I know of at least a half a dozen of them that were in their 80s. There you go. Uh, and so uh, they're riding and camping just like everybody else is. That's interesting information. I noticed when I went in your shop, the customer was going out with a bike that had tires about as big as an auto tire. They were about that big around. And yeah. then some of the bikes in your shop were light enough. You could lift them up with your finger, you know. So we have many all. types of bikes. So do you think there's anything that besides the, the, the tricycle and the recumbent that would help old, older people ride better? Or? I think, you know, un unless you have balance issues, uh, any bike is available to you to ride. Yep. Uh, we have some that uh, allow you to put your feet flat on the ground at a stop. Typically, unless you're a tall person like yourself, that's kind of hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I, w I wouldn't discount any bike for anybody, re just yeah, depending on their go. age. There you go. As long as you can get your feet on the ground, you don't have yeah. to fall down. Yeah, right? and you don't have to go very fast to maintain your balance. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, Lincoln has some great hiking and biking trails, and I've noticed when I was out on the hiking biking trails, it's usually when everybody's at work or at class, mm -hmm. but there's a, most of the people are mature that are biking or, or hiking along those trails. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, so, get, uh, we have several customers that uh, come in us on a routine basis because they're out on their rides and they need some kind of adjustment or just stopping in to get some water, whatever it happened to be. But uh, yeah. the morning time is a a pretty popular time for everybody to ride. There Typically, they're the seniors that are riding. There you go. That's that's good. Well, I mean, I'm just curious. Do you ride? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, well, it's kind of like golf, you know. <laughs> Instead of we, I have clubs. Yep. See. Yep. But when I get out on the course, it's not necessarily golf. That's sure. the same with me. I have a bike, but when I get on it, it's not necessarily. <laughs> but you ride it. Yes, sir. That's the main thing. I sure do. You have to ride it. Yep. And. It might be what keeping me in shape so I can come down here and talk to you. I don't know. Well, the health benefits, like you mentioned, are, are huge. You know, it, it yes, helps your the, cardiovascular yeah. system. And it helps your mental attitude and, uh, and the fresh air. And, and we have a beautiful city here. Lower in, it's lower impact than, than running. running, for example. Yeah. I'd like to thank my guest, Rick Dockhorn of CycleWorks, for telling us about biking in the Lincoln area as it relates to older adults. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn or to get involved with biking.